Since money intrinsically contains neither directives nor obstacles, it follows the strongest subjective impulse that within all money matters appears to be the egoistic impulse. The inhibiting notion that certain amounts of money may be stained with blood or be under a curse are sentimentalities that lose their significance completely with the growing indifference of money, that is, as money increasingly becomes nothing but mere money. Money's purely negative quality, that its use, unlike other forms of ownership, is in no way restricted by objective or ethical considerations, inevitably develops into inconsiderateness as a completely positive kind of attitude. Money's flexibility, which follows from its being detached from particular interests, origins and relations, entails as a necessary logical consequence the invitation to us not to restrain ourselves in those spheres of life in which money predominates. The absolute objectivity that results from the elimination of all one-sided objectivity makes a clean sweep in favor of egoism, as did pure intellectuality, for no other reason than because this guiding principle is logically the simplest, the closest at hand, so that the purely formal and indifferent forces of life attain in it their primary, as it were, natural, and congenial fulfillment. Money's relationship to the rationalism of law and logic it is not only, as I mentioned earlier, that the form of law in general, together with intellectuality and money transactions, disregards the objectively and morally most perverse contents, but rather it is that this discrepancy between form and real content culminates in the principle of equality. Before the law, all three factors, the law, intellectuality and money are characterized by their complete indifference to individual qualities, all three extract from the concrete totality of the streams of life one abstract, general factor which develops according to its own independent norms and which intervenes in the totality of existential interests and imposes itself upon them. In that all three of them have the power to lay down forms and directions for contents to which they are indifferent, they necessarily inject those contradictions into the totality of life which concern us here. Wherever equality impinges upon the formal foundations of human relationships, it serves to express individual inequalities most pointedly and far-reachingly. By observing the limits imposed by formal equality, egoism need no longer concern itself with internal and external barriers. It possesses, in the general validity of that equality, a weapon which, by serving anyone, may also be used against anyone. The forms of legal equality are the typical forms that intellectuality as well as money share, their general availability and validity, their potential communism which removes for everyone, those of higher, lower and equal position alike. Certain barriers that resulted from the a priori, status-related demarcation of types of property. As long as landed property and the professions were in the hands of certain classes, they entailed certain obligations toward the lower orders, solidarity with others of the same class, and clear limits to the ambition of outsiders. Yet an enlightened rationalism has no reason for retaining these any longer if every property can be transferred into a value, the unlimited acquisition of which is, in principle, denied to no one. This, of course, does not answer the question as to whether the total amount of egoism increases or decreases in the course of history. Finally, I want to refer to the very characteristic fact that the accumulation of intellectual achievements, which gives a disproportionate and rapidly growing advantage to those who are favored by it, also has its analogy in the accumulation of money capital. The structure of monetary relationships, the way in which money yields returns and profits, is such that, beyond a certain amount, money multiplies without a corresponding effort on the part of the owner. This corresponds to the structure of knowledge in the cultural world which requires, beyond a certain point, decreasing self-acquisition on the part of the individual, because the cognitive content is increasingly offered in a condensed and, beyond a certain level, concentrated form. The highest stages of education require less effort for every step further than the lower stages, and yet, at the same time, produce greater results. Just as the objectivity of money permits work that is ultimately relatively independent of personal energies and the accumulating returns lead automatically to more accumulation in growing proportions, so the objectification of knowledge, the separation of the results of intelligence from its process, causes these results to accumulate in the form of concentrated abstractions, so that, if only one stands high enough, they may be picked like fruits that have ripened without any effort on our part. As a result of all this, the tendencies in favor of general equality most decisively reject money, 
even though it is by nature a basically democratic leveling social form that excludes any specific individual relationships. Here we have the same result, for the same reason as we observed with regard to intellectuality. Universality in a logical substantive sense and universality in a social practical sense fall asunder in the two spheres. In other spheres they often enough do coincide. For instance, it has been stated, regardless of whether this is an exhaustive definition, that the essence of art is to represent in its content the typical general features of phenomena so as to appeal to the typical human emotions that reside in us, and that art's principal claim to subjective acceptance is based on the exclusion of all fortuitous and individual elements from its object. In the same manner, the forms of religion transcend all temporal particularity to the level of the absolute and universal and, in so doing, secure a relationship to what is most common to all individuals and to what unites them in the human world. By their all-embracing unity, the forms of religion release us from our merely individual attributes, by relating them back to the basic traits that are felt to be the common roots of everything human. The same is true of morality as conceived by Kant. The mode of action that may be logically generalized without contradicting itself should also be the moral law for everyone regardless of his identity. The criterion operating here is that one might conceive of the practical maxim as natural law, such that its conceptual, objective universality establishes the universality for all subjects, for whom it becomes a moral imperative. In contrast to these forms, modern life in other spheres seems rather to increase the tension between objective universality of content and universality of personal relationships. Certain elements gain an increasingly larger universality of content, they become more significant for an increasing number of details and relationships, their definition includes, directly or indirectly, an increasingly larger part of reality. This is true, for example, of law, the processes and results of intellectuality, and money. It is accompanied by their elevation to subjectively differentiated forms of life, by the utilization of their all-embracing importance for the practice of egoism, and by the full development of personal differences on the basis of this leveling material, since it is generally accessible and valid and therefore offers no resistance to any individual will. The confusion and the feeling of secret self-contradiction which in so many points characterizes the style of modern life is partly based on this imbalance and tension between the content and objective significance of these spheres and their personal use and development with regard to universality and equality. The calculating character of modern times. I want to mention a final trait in the style of contemporary life whose rationalistic character clearly betrays the influence of money. By and large, one may characterize the intellectual functions that are used at present in coping with the world and in regulating both individual and social relations as calculative functions. Their cognitive ideal is to conceive of the world as a huge arithmetical problem, to conceive events and the qualitative distinction of things as a system of numbers. Kant believed that natural philosophy was scientific only to the extent that mathematics could be applied in it. Yet it is not only the physical world that has to be intellectually conquered by measuring and weighing, for pessimism as well as optimism wishes to establish the value of life by balancing pleasure and pain and its ideal is the quantitative calculation of both factors. The frequent determination of public life through majority votes is a manifestation of the same trend. To subject the individual to majority decision through the fact that others, not superior, but equal, hold a different opinion is not as natural as it may appear to us today.